Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. And so uh, we're in the book of Jonah. Turn to the book of Jonah. We're starting a series, Jonah and the Mercy of God. And I, I wanna share with you why this is on my heart today. And this book is, uh, is, is a minor prophet with a major lesson and message for us today. That we're living in a society where really what's going on is the world is, um, is really trying to divide us as people. And it's, it's, it's working, unfortunately. And division is something, it's a reality that we need to understand is here. And that we gotta be careful it doesn't affect us as a church for sure but it also doesn't affect our ability to minister to the people in our community. It just seems like we're always having to pick a side right now where we stand on something. Am I right or am I wrong? Just always feels like that. And Jonah, Jonah is in a similar situation where God is asking him to do something very hard and that's to go plead with a nation that he does not like and to give them a second chance, and he does not like this. This is a, a very difficult task from God, and, uh, and Jonah doesn't wanna do it, and he runs, and we're gonna learn that and see that. Um, but what I was noticing in this scripture is that if we're not careful, that we can grow bitter and cold towards those who stand against us and God when it comes to the Christians and when it comes to God. If we're not careful, we can grow bitter and cold towards those people who oppose us. And that is not at all what God wants us to do. God does not want us to become cold and bitter towards those around us. God's heart breaks for the lost. And so I'm praying today that we will, one, appreciate the mercy that God has shown us, the grace, the compassion, the love that he has shown us. But may we also be convicted and inspired by the mercy that God shows even our enemies. And this is not going to be an easy message for us as believers. In fact, this letter was, or this uh, story and uh, this prophet book was used to help the Jews, the Israelites, learn from Jonah's life. This was a living illustration of Israel's heart and heart towards God. Uh, Jonah will be this picture of Israel and how their heart is hardened towards God and how they're rebellious to God. This letter is also um, a picture of God's love for Gentile people, not just the Jews, and we learned that in our Ephesians series, that God has a missional heart. So you're gonna see the missions coming through this series. Um, so we have a few themes there. We're also gonna see the sovereignty of God, that God has control over land and sea and power and really big fish. <laughs> and. God's merciful. Uh, God calls us to repentance. We're going to see themes of disobedience in here, unfortunately. Um, and so let's, let's jump in. But I'm praying that in the midst of all this, uh, the negativity that we see in this story, we also see the beauty of God in giving second chances. And God wants the world to turn back to him too. And so while Jonah had a hard time accepting that, I'm praying that we won't have a hard time accepting that those who oppose Christians, and more importantly, oppose God, that our heart would stay tender towards them. Amen? That our heart would still break for them. That's the gist of this entire series. And this is what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to walk through the text today and, and stop and pause and, and share some things and then, and then get back into reading through the text. Let me pray first. God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We need it. Speak to us today. Do a work on our hearts, and may this word move us to compassion and mercy for the lost. God, thank you for showing us mercy and love when we didn't deserve it. And Lord, may our hearts not be cold or bitter or hardened towards our fellow man and our neighbors and those around us who would disagree with us. And God, that's a reality that we have to face and Lord, you called us to stand firm in the truth, but may we also do it in love. So help us this series, God, to grasp your huge heart for those who are far from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Jonah is meant to go to this massive city in Nineveh, and the announcement is judgment, but it's not judgment first. The announcement is turn, repent, and the wrath of God, uh, the destruction of the city would not happen if the people turn from their wicked ways and turn back to God, the theme of repentance right away in the first couple of verses. But Jonah doesn't like the idea of these people turning away from wickedness and turning towards God. And this is what he said, or this is what happens in verse three. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Mm. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, I don't want to be hard on Jonah, but we're just going to see where we need to see how severe this was that he would disobey God because it's going to help us see how big God's mercy is even in Jonah's life. Okay, so bear with me. But here's, here maybe there are some reasonable uh, reasons and, and maybe even, you know, I feel for Jonah because God's asking him to do a very difficult task. He's asking him to go to his enemies and give them a second chance. And that sounds amazing, but to, to Jonah, and if you're, if you're Ninevite, you want that because God's wrath will destroy them. But Jonah, he doesn't like it. And here's a few reasons why. One, the reputation of the Ninevites where they were ruthless and violent towards all people. There are things that they did to innocent people that I cannot even say in this room because of young ears. But if I could give you just a, a, just a slice of the severity of the Ninevites, um, they bragged about how they tortured and killed and displayed dead bodies around their city. Um, there are other things they did that I can't say, but I will go towards um, uh, pyramids and piles of skulls and bodies, and that's about as far as I'm going to go. And they were just ruthless. There was no mercy. It's, it's really interesting. They were merciless, and yet God wants to show them mercy. And this is what Jonah knows. Um, we also know that according to Amos and Nahum, or Hosea, sorry, uh, they predict the coming destruction of Israel by Assyria. Now, Assyria, or Nineveh, is Assyria's capital. So when we're talking about the Ninevites, we're talking about the Assyrians. And Hosea and Amos predict the coming destruction of Israel. So Jonah's like, why would I want to help? Jonah knows this already. It's already been prophesied. And Jonah's like, why would I want to help the people who are going to destroy my people in the future? If, his, if the Israelites don't turn away. Why would I want to help them? And then lastly, this is interesting, just really simple. You see this coming forward in our story throughout the rest of the book. Jonah knew that God is a merciful God and that if the people of, of, of Nineveh repent, that he would not destroy them and he would spare them and he didn't want them to be spared. You know what, you know what that means? Here's the reality. God is, God is more merciful than we humans are, isn't he? In fact, I don't think I want to be in the hands of people when I'm judged. I'd rather be in the hands of God because he'll be a fair judge and a merciful judge and a just judge. He would judge accordingly and properly. But I've seen the mercy of people, and, and we're, we're pretty cruel at times, aren't we, if we're honest? And so Jonah's showing actually a, a picture of not just his state, but also the state of Israel. And so God's not a big fan of this, so what comes up is, uh, is, is really important. But I want, to, I want you to see this map of how, how much... Jonah did not like the idea of doing this. Does it look like Jonah was trying to go really far away from God and his call? Because Nineveh is to the right and Tarshish is 2,500 miles away to the left. 
This just gives you an idea of how, um, how much Jonah disliked this task from God. And just so you know, uh, God will give you tasks you don't like. Uh, and this is one of them for Jonah. This was not an easy task if we're fair to Jonah because he knows how evil and wicked uh, the Ninevites and the Assyrians are and how ruthless they are. So, you know, let's not be too hard on him or too judgmental. Um, but this is a picture of what we can be like if, if we're not careful. And so this, this, this didn't make God happy, I would say, um, or God was like, not so fast, you know? And so let's go to verse four. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. What we see here is God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he is sovereign over what he's created, especially land and sea and all of this. And so now God has caused this storm to disrupt Jonah's rebellion and to get him back on track. Now, he's with Phoenicians, men uh, from Tarshish, sailors. They're pagans. They're not believers in the one true God. And they worship many gods, so they're Gentile people. And they are so afraid that they are starting to shout out to their gods for help and start throwing over the cargo. That's how bad this storm was. When I read this it hit me that our disobedience doesn't just affect us, but it affects those around us. And it wouldn't just affect Nineveh that Jonah was going the other way and their destiny, but it was affecting the sailors immediately in Jonah's situation in the storm. It's funny how Jonah thought that if he can buy a ticket to Tarshish, he could buy his way away from God. But what he didn't realize is when you buy any ticket running from God, you're still running to God. Because God is omnipresent. So you would think that the believer of God, the one who worships God, would be the one who's up praying. But instead, we see something very interesting in the next verse. But all this time, verse five still, all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. Something's wrong with this picture. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. How ironic is it that a pagan ship captain had to call a man of God to prayer? And the need was so great that these, these godless Phoenician sailors, these pagan sailors are crying out to their God. That's the first thing you think of is cry out. We're in trouble. And yet God's servant slept. And a commentator said this. This one's going to sting a little bit. There's a few things in this sermon that stings a little bit, just so you know. What an object lesson to God's people then and now to awaken from apathy as crying people perish on the sea of life. Oh, Lord, let it not be that your people are not asleep while people are perishing. Let it be that we are awake. Amen, church? Let us be awake to the needs of the lives all around us in this sea of life. Let us be awake to see how dangerous this is. Jonah wasn't dangerous life is without God. Jonah wasn't phased. In fact, he's sleeping like he did nothing wrong. Now, I've never saw this until I was studying for this months ago. And I realized something. Only someone who's lost his guilty conscience could sleep after disobeying God. And to make things worse, there's a violent storm and he's still sleeping. In our world right now, uh, the guilty conscience, 
the feeling of doing something wrong is quickly fading away. It already has, hasn't it? We, in our world, we're not, and I say generally, but this could be for us specifically in the church as well, we don't feel the healthy guilt that we need to feel when we do something wrong. And Jonah, he should be up, troubled in his spirit that he disobeyed God, but instead he's sleeping like a baby, which, by the way, my babies didn't really sleep that good, so I don't know what that means. But he's sleeping good, and he shouldn't be. He should be a wide awake and bothered that he disobeyed his God. Uh, let it be also that the church still feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let it be that we don't harden our hearts and, and lose the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. When we do something wrong, may we confess it to God, may we apologize, you know, may we repent and do the right thing and instead of sleeping really well, knowing we did something wrong, you know, it just to me, it sounded like a bad sign there. Is it possible that we're seeing here in this story how, how much of a dark place Jonah went to, you know? He really did not like the idea of going over there, and he seemed to justify it in his heart as well, enough to go, peace, God, I'm going to Tarshish, and on the way, I'm just going to sleep through it. Well, they do something that can seem like divination. In verse 7, it says, Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. And when they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. What does that mean? Well, back then, they would put items that may belong to a certain person. So this person gets this figurine or this piece of wood, and they would put it in a bucket or a hat, you know, or something. And whatever one they drew out, that means that person was the culprit. So it wasn't necessarily that they did some weird magician divination activity. It was just that they, by chance, this is who it would be. But commentators believe that God sovereignly made sure that Jonah's was picked because he wasn't even paying attention. He was still trying to wake up as this captain is yelling at him. And so the, the lots fell on Jonah, and God made sure of it that he was the one, he was a culprit, maybe because he wasn't going to admit it that he was the one. So that's where casting lots comes in. And it goes on to say in verse 8, why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. They started interrogating Jonah. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? And Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Wow. Jonah comes clean, and he admits that it's his God pretty much causing all of this because he's the God of land and sea. But isn't it interesting that he actually claims to worship God and yet disobeys him at the same time? You would think that he probably shouldn't do that because now he looks hypocritical. Now he looks like a hypocrite. But he, go, he, he claims to worship God and yet he did the opposite of what he should do. Let it not be. You follow me on these let it not be or let it be? Let it be that when we claim to worship God, we also obey God in our worship. Lord, help us to do that. Because worship is to obey God too. Not just sing songs on Sunday. Amen, you follow me? It's to obey him in all things, even to do the hard things he asks us to do. But you know what? Jonah came clean. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about life and the storms we go through in life, the trials, the difficulty, and I thought, wow, here's a perfect example that not every storm is from the devil. You know, sometimes we don't take responsibility for the storms in our lives. And sometimes God's behind it to get our attention, to get us back on track. Not every storm is the devil because it may be our disobedience. And I want to encourage you to do something that I've done. If you're going through a storm, before starting to point fingers at anyone, 
pray to God and ask him to reveal if you are at the root of this storm. You know, God, search my heart, our heart. See if there's any offensive way. See if I've done something wrong. Show me if I've been off. If I have gotten my, got myself or everyone else in this situation in this mess, then I confess it and I'm sorry. Because it took Jonah to go through this to admit that it was him. But God uses this storm to graciously steer Jonah back. God will use difficult times in your life to steer you back because he loves you that much. It's not always the devil. It's not always your friend. It's not always the person that offended you. It could also be us. And God, listen, the safest place to be in is the will of God. And God loves you so much that he will put you through things until he gets your attention and steers you back on the right track. Thank God for that. You know what that is? That's God's mercy for you. My mic might be dying, just so you guys know. So I might need a new mic. That is God's mercy for us. That he would allow us to go through trials to get us to look and to humble ourselves and to look within and with him what could be going on. Now, the sailors were terrified, verse 10, when they heard this. <laughs> because they're like, wait, your God is the God of sea and land? So they say, for he, he had already told me he was running away from the Lord. So they said this, why did you do it? Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. If you put it in Ryan's version. What were you thinking, man? Are you serious? Your God controls the oceans? And, and you put us in this predicament? Oh, my goodness. And they're like, what should we do to stop this storm? And Jonah says, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Now, that looks really, you know, sacrificial and kind. You know, throw me in the sea. Uh, you know, it's my fault. But do you know what some people wonder, and I wonder too, is Jonah was willing to die because he could not stand the Ninevites that much. You just kind of have to wonder, you know? Like, he didn't say, throw me in the sea, it's my fault, God will save me with some big fish. He didn't say that. He's like, throw, this is my way out. What if that's, what if that's this, we don't know for sure, but what if that's the situation? What if he's thinking, I can't stand this task from God so much that I'd rather die? Well, guess what? In chapter four, we find out he'd rather die. So it's not, an, it's not, we're not guessing. He actually says, I'd rather die. Wow. Of course, you have to read the whole letter, the whole book to realize that. So he's like, throw me in. But God has different plans for Jonah. Aren't you grateful that sometimes you make the wrong choice and God's like, I love you too much to let you just slip away like that. <clears throat> Come on, that spoke to someone today. Someone needed to hear that. We will make foolish mistake after foolish mistake. We will disobey God. We'll run away from this call. Then we're in a boat and we decide to do something we shouldn't do. In a storm, we still make a bad choice. And yet God's mercy is so big, he does something else to help us. Come on, that is beautiful. Well, I'm humbled by what I read next. Because they were supposed to throw him in. He's like, it's my fault. But verse 13 says, instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded. Don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Even they acknowledge that God has a good reason to do this. But what blew me away is that they're showing more mercy, and they're pagan, unbelieving people. They're showing more mercy than Jonah, who should know better. Again, this letter, this, this book would be 
an illustration to the entire people of God, the chosen people, the Israelites. This was meant that they would read this one day and go, don't be like this, you know? Don't have a hard heart towards your enemies. Um, And so this is an illustration. It's a lesson for even us today to not let to not let the enemy cause us to be bitter and cold towards them. But also, look at the mercy that they showed, and they weren't even, in our day, Christian, they weren't believers in God, and they tried. Could they have been also afraid of dying? Yes, we read that. We don't want to die. And then we don't want to be uh, in charge of killing this guy. So, Lord, spare us. Spare us. So what happens next? Verse 15, then the sailors, probably reluctantly, thank you, brother, appreciate that. God brought this storm on, and now God stops the storm. Uh, Just so you know, a lot of people mistaken the book of Jonah as Jonah as the main character. But the reality is, it actually looks like God is the main character of this book. What we're seeing is, is God working throughout this entire book to fulfill his purposes in the midst of our mistakes He wants to still do it. He redeems. He fixes them. And God is so good that he actually redeems Jonah's rebellion to show these sailors his glory and power. Because this is what happens next. The sailors were all struck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now, does that give us an excuse to disobey God because then he'll redeem our disobedience and do something good with it? No. In fact, I'll just be honest with you, many times our disobedience becomes a hindrance of people coming to God. Let's be real. In other words, we don't want to test how good God is and how creative he can be to fix our messes, you know? Let's not put God to the test and disobey over and over again so that he can figure it all out and work it all out. No, that's not how it works. God chose to redeem this situation. In spite of Jonah's foolishness, he would still bring glory to his name and convert these men to worship and serve him. Maybe because God cares about the people in Tarshish too. Not just in Nineveh, not just in Israel but he cares about the whole world. The book of Jonah was written. The story came about. God wanted this out because he wanted to show his love for all people, not just the chosen Jews. That's why when we get to Ephesians and we learn about that, his gospel was for all people, not just the elect, not just the chosen ones, but for all who would believe in him. Where does that come from? The promise that God gave Abraham, that you will be a blessing to all nations. Through you, I will bless all nations. God opens his door to all people. And here we see the gospel. We see random Gentile sailors who didn't believe in God and worshiped other gods, false gods, now converting. And Jonah didn't make that happen. God did. God made that happen. So Jonah came and take the credit for that. Bottom line, we should always obey first. Amen. Amen. But somehow, even when we don't, God finds a way to turn it around. But not every time. Please be careful. Don't, do not let this be an excuse to go do something wrong. That's not the point here. But there are times where God goes, well, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that God, that I still get the glory and I save these lives. And I praise God for that. You know what that is? That's the mercy of God. Doesn't deserve it. 
People don't deserve the mercy of God. We don't deserve the mercy of God. And by the way, the mercy of God is his nature. It's part of who he is. He's a merciful God. What is that? It's help to the helpless. Those who are so far from him, they can't help themselves. They can't save themselves. And Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God. But God gave us his one and only son. So when we couldn't save ourselves, mercy saves us. God is the one who initiates the mercy so that we can be saved. And God is initiating the mercy here in this story. And God shows mercy to Jonah in verse 17. Now, theologians believe and the manuscripts believe as well that verse 17 should be in chapter 2. And we'll get there next week. But in, our, in most Bibles today, they have it in chapter 1. And verse 17 says, Now the Lord had arranged, remember the main character is actually God, for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. The mercy that God called Jonah to show to the Ninevites is now the same mercy that spares his life. Praise God for that. Does Jonah deserve to be spared here? Not really, if we're being real and just and fair. But guess what? God is a merciful God. And he doesn't think the way we think. He doesn't judge the way we judge. To God, God's like, yes, and I'm going to give him my mercy. And he does it in the weirdest way. A giant fish. And swallows him up. And next week, we're going to see what happens inside this fish. How weird is that? I know you already know this story. But what are some things that we can apply to our life today? Well, real quick, if you're in this room and you're afraid that God is angry with you, according to this story, God has his arms open wide with mercy. The key is, what we find out in chapter 3, is if the people repent, they find a merciful, loving God. If they don't, they find the just, holy God that will punish them for their sins. If you've been afraid of God, maybe you've been raised to be afraid of God, that he's going to strike you down. This story would say that that is not God and that God is a merciful God waiting for you to return to him. So repent. And if that's you today, repent. Turn away from your sinful things. Turn away from your sinful habits and patterns because you're going to find a God who loves you. Amen? Now, this one hurt me when I wrote it down. <laughs> Secondly, we love receiving God's mercy, but struggle when he shows it to our enemy. Well, guess what? God loves your enemy too. God loves, I don't have any enemies. I don't believe, I don't think I do, but God loves the people who oppose us and our beliefs, our faith. If someone opposes this church, if there's, if there's people you know, praying against this church to, to Satan or something like that, God loves them. And in the middle of all of that, and by the way, that does happen, just so you know. So that's why we need to be praying. We need to pray because there are circles of, of Wiccans uh, praying against churches in this area. Okay? And, of course, we know God wins and God's the victorious one. But we need to be praying, right? But guess what? I'm praying for their salvation so they'll stop praying like that. If I deserve... if I did, I don't feel like I deserved it, but if God was willing to show me mercy, then I think I need to be careful because I think God wants to show them mercy too. Sin's a sin. And if I'm far from God and they're far from God, then, then we're equal, right? Thank God I'm not. Thank God he brought me into his marvelous light. Thank God Jesus saved me. Thank God I recognized it. But I'm concerned that this world is trying to divide us. I'm going to bring it back to the beginning, what I said. This world is trying, it's It's Satan. If we can be fighting about surfacey things in our world, then we won't focus on people's salvation. And right here, God's like trying to get Jonah's attention. Look, I know what they've done. I know how wicked they are, but I want them to be saved because they're that helpless and that wicked. They need me. 
And I'm praying that we never have a bitter heart towards anyone in our world to the point that we forget about their salvation. We must remember that God loves them. So what do we do? Thirdly, we encourage everyone to turn back to God while showing them the love that God has shown us. Hey, it's not, it's not easy having frank conversations with people about turning back to him. It can take time. You heard me preach about the BLESS acronym, you know, having a conversation and, um, you know, first praying, listening, eating together, and serving, and then sharing your story. It takes time to get to the place where you're going to be real. But there's, there's times, too, where God says, hey, encourage them to turn back to me right now. I've been working on them. I've been working on them. Fourth, we can't outrun God. Can you deny God's mercy? Yeah, people do. People resist. But he will relentlessly pursue you all the days of your life. Psalm 23, 6, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. That was David. He messed up. He messed up multiple times, and yet God's love kept pursuing him, pursuing him, pursuing him. Because when we repent and turn back to God, we find a loving, merciful God. And lastly, don't run from God. We can't outrun him. He will find you. He'll get your attention. And if he's asked you to do something, I want to encourage you to do it. And I pray that you can't sleep at night. And, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't wish that. I, I, I like to sleep. So. But I pray that God moves on your heart to be so obedient that you can sleep at night in peace in your heart. You did the right thing. And it could be anything. This could apply to so many things in your life. But God, can I just keep it missional? Because this is a missional book. We've been talking about the mission and the heart of God in the past month or so. God has a message for your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends. Don't run from that, that task. Even if it's someone you, you have a really hard time getting along with, love on them and share the love of God with them. Amen? Don't, don't, don't do it. God's plan and purpose is bigger than you think. It, you can't see the end. Jonah didn't know what was, Jonah had no idea if he disobeyed that, that a big old fish would swallow him up. He had no idea. You have no idea how God's gonna help you. Just obey and watch him work. Amen? I'm going to pray in a moment, and uh, I'm going to close the service as well because we had our announcements, and I want to pray for a few things. One, our college students uh, going back to, to campuses around the nation. We want to pray for Haiti and the earthquake that took place. We want to pray for our military who are, um, we're being sending more military to Afghanistan right now to help with that. There's a lot of things to pray about, isn't there? And uh, forgiving wise, uh, we've had some people ask, you know, where do we give some guests? You know, first of all, guests, we don't, we encourage you to, to just visit. Don't feel like you have to give uh, today or anything like that. Um, we give as people of God and we don't have the, the usual Sorry, as members of the church and people of God, we give here on a regular basis, but we don't have the bags that go through the aisles because we've been giving um, at the doorways and online. So some people have been asking about that. But can I just say thank you for your generosity? Last week, we were able to bless Christine Flora with, with a really generous blessing for her work in Boston at the university. And we're surprising Joe and Heidi with a little gift as well because you guys were so giving in your offering. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. And there's a lot going on at Calvary, so check our website. You can go to calvarydover.org, look at events, or look at the bulletin online to see what we have going on here. Um, but I want to pray for those things. I want to pray the mercy of God. So why don't we stand together? And God's mercy to move in these situations. And again, thank you for your giving. Um, I know I'm kind of rushing this ending here, but... I just wanted you to be aware of that, uh, where we give right now. And um, God, our heart grieves for the people in Haiti right now. Lord, I pray you would spare lives. Have mercy on this country. God, if you're getting their attention, I pray, Lord, they would turn to you. Lord, I pray that your church and, and Convoy of Hope and other 
organizations down there, God, I pray you give them strength and provision to do what they need to do. Lord, I pray miracles would take place in the rubble, God, that they would find people alive, that miracles would take place even as a week goes, Lord. And Lord, just help them all. Lord, turn their hearts back to you. Lord, I lift up our, our military and their families as we see military return to Afghanistan to help out right now. I just pray, Lord, that you would be with them and keep them safe. May their families have peace. Give wisdom and guidance to our military leadership as well. Lord, we pray for our college students. As we heard last week, it's, it's hard to be a Christian on a secular campus, and it can even be hard on a Christian campus. And Lord, I pray you would be with our students. Keep them safe. Lord, help them to be, to shine on their campuses for you. Help them to show the mercy of God. Lord, keep them faithful to you. And may Jesus be alive and well in them on these campuses. Lord, we thank you for the mercy you've shown us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. You just give it. And God, I pray we'd stop running from it. And if we need to turn back to you, I pray today we would turn back to you and find that you're a loving God, a God of many second chances. And I pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to obey you, to do the hard things that you ask us to do, because they're not always easy. It's not always easy to obey you, but it's the right thing to do. And it honors you and worships you. So God, thank you that we can learn this. Thank you, God, that your heart is so big. It's for all people, even those who oppose us as Christians. And God, thank you for the generosity of this church, for the faithfulness of giving so we can do the ministry we're doing in this community and around the world with our missionaries. Thank you, Lord. Bless everyone here today as we go our separate ways. We give you all the glory and praise. Use us in a mighty way this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.